Well, good morning. So I had somebody in the parking lot ask me, they said, it sounds like you're walking away from your microphone. So I, I'm not sure what I'm doing, but somehow I'm bending this or something, which would that surprise anyone that I could actually walk away from a microphone that's on my ear? Maybe I'm wiggling my ears and I don't know it. So it's great to see you guys this morning. Today we're going to talk about keeping the main thing, the main thing. So I'm going to start with a question. Are you ready? You're not going to like this question. Let me just point that out right ahead of time. Isn't that great to start with a question that makes you mad at me? That's great. So here's the question. What did you focus on this week? Day after day, Monday through Friday, even Saturday, I'll give you Saturday too. What did you focus on? What, what, what were you thinking about? Where, where were your thoughts guiding you? What, what were you seeing as, as the most important things? You know, years ago, uh, uh, Mr. Rogers, if you never haven't read this quote yet, Mr. Rogers said that his parents, when something would happen, and he talked about this at September 11th, he said, when tragedy happens or when riots happen or when something we don't like happens, he said, look for the helpers. But I want to take that one step farther this week. I want you to look to the helper. This week, as, as you're dealing with different things, some of you are trying to figure out how to navigate. How, how can I be friends with somebody who's from a totally different culture than I am? A friend of mine who looks different than me. A friend of mine who maybe has been harassed when he goes in the grocery store. For those of you who don't know, I have a very good friend who has African children. He adopted from Africa. And when he goes with his children, some are who are his biological children and some are his non-biological adopted children. They've become part of his family. And he goes into a grocery store or a dollar general. They will follow his African children around the store. And so whether or not you know it or not, there are people that we need to be sensitive to, not because you ever did anything, but because they've been hurt. And when people have been hurt, you don't push on their hurts. I hope if I'm wearing a cast one day, Everybody except for Dave won't grab it. Dave's going to grab it. How's it feeling? And as Christians, we need to go out of our way to love and care and look to the helper to guide us in what to do. Dave told me he was cold last night, so I told him I would sweat today. So if you're warm today, blame him. His wife will be calling him later. I want to start with the verse today. Last night I started with the story, but I'm going to get to the story. And here's what I'm going to talk about. How to focus on the main thing. So I'm going to give you three points today and how to focus on the main thing. I'm going to give you an illustration in a minute. But I want to give you the verse first and then go to the illustration. So first of all, you have to discover the main thing. We tend to focus on what we think is important at the time, but we have to discover the main thing. And I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Jesus, some Pharisees, some Sadducees, they're lawyers. They had lawyers. <laughs> when a religious group has lawyers, you're in trouble. So they had lawyers, and that's because they really were not just a religious group. These were also political groups. Many think the Pharisees were more political than the Sadducees. Some debate about that, but I don't really care. They were all trying to trick Jesus because they didn't like that he was taking followers away from them. That's what they were about. So they tried to trick him. They tried to trap him by talking to him about taxes. You know, maybe they can get the Romans mad at him. And he, he just said, pay to Caesar who, what's Caesar's, which is like, doggone it. He got us again. So then they try to trick him about the law, hoping that maybe they can punish him in Jerusalem because he's, he's gone against the law. And here's what it says. He says, teacher... Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And they knew if Jesus pointed out one specific command that they could call him a heretic and, and maybe even uh, uh, kill him. But at least ostracize him from their religious circles by saying, look at him, he's attacking God. Jesus goes back to the Old Testament. He goes back to Deuteronomy and he goes back to Leviticus and he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So I want to show you something. 
Now, we're in Florida. Some of the people watching are from Iowa, so I'm going to have to explain a few things. Because these Iowa people, how many of you have been to the beach? Right, right? Okay, so everybody in here has been to the beach. The Iowa people right now might be like, so the beach looks a little like corn when it's swaying. I don't know. I don't have a good illustration for them. Hopefully, they've been to the beach. So hopefully, they visited their cousins here in Florida. So if you've been to the beach, you go out and you put up your chair and then maybe, now we tried to figure this out last night and I didn't lose it, but I'm guessing today this thing's going down. Don't you think, Dave? And then what you do, you set up your ugly beach umbrella. By the way, I was told by several people they have the same ugly umbrella. Anybody in here have the same ugly umbrella? Raise your hand. I want to see you. So you set it up. Jesus, help me here. Jesus, take the wheel. When I'm driving, I always say, Jesus, take the wheel and ram that guy. So, <laughs> isn't that what Carl does? No, Carl just takes the wheel. Okay. So, you go to the beach, right? And you got your boogie board and you sit down and you sit in your chair for about three seconds. And then you realize there's good waves, right? So, you go and you get your boogie board or your surfboard or, or maybe you body surf. Because like me, you've got a little extra flotation device around your belly. And you go out in the ocean and you start riding the waves, right? And you're riding the waves and riding the waves. And on a day where the waves are kind of small, you ride the waves, you turn around, you walk back to your chair. No big deal. Somebody put one of these faces just to distract me. Brian, that had to be you. I know he's a country music. Who is this? Aren't you glad I don't know that? Now you put a, you put a picture of David Lee Roth and I'll know who that is. All right. So... Boy, I just lost half the people in the thing. Okay. Weird Al? Okay. That better? Okay. Now everybody likes Weird Al. All right. So anyway, so you're out. Bodies are, now listen, if you have never been in big waves, you don't know what I'm about to tell you. If you go, especially boogie boarding or surfing in big waves, they literally spin you round, round, spin you round, round, like a record player, round, 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 round. Right? And, and, and before you know it, you don't know where you are. And if the waves are big, typically the, the undercurrent and even the pull is bad. And you end up down the beach. And if you're like me, you pop up. And you go, where am I? And you start looking around. First, you look the wrong way. You think you're looking towards shore. And you're looking, that's, that's how dizzy you get. You're looking and you're like, I don't see land. Maybe I'm 50 miles out for just a second. And then you turn around. Oh, I'm right here. And then you look and you realize, where am I? I have carried down the, and you don't even know which way you've carried down the beach. So you scan the beach. And unless everyone else has brought their un ugly umbrella, you suddenly realize there's ugly umbrella. And then you make your way back to ugly umbrella and chair and you sit down and you catch your breath. <sighs> and you remember where home is for you. Now listen. This world. I'll pose for you later Laura. This world. She's trying to take a picture. This world is not home. You are in the ocean. And you are in a world that loves for you to get turned around. And turned upside down. And, and lose your peace. And to, to get under pressure all the time. Until all you can hear is. Dun 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 dun. Dun, 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 right? And you're just, you're just all the time just under pressure. And you don't know where you're at. And you don't know which way you're facing. And you don't know what's next. And you don't know what's matter. And even if you're a Christian, at one time you knew about God. And you got verses kind of in the back of your mind. But you've lost focus. Listen, listen, listen. Go back home. Home is not here. Home is heaven. And every day, if we're going to love God with all of our heart... How we feel, the things we, we, we feel in life. All our mind, what we focus on in life. All of our soul, the things we really care about. If we're going to love God with all of that, guess what? Every day, just like Jesus, every day we have to take time to spend a little time at home. To spend a little time in God's word. To, to spend some time in prayer so that when we're out in the world, in the ocean, floating around and life hits you with a big wave, the doctor says something and... And I don't know if you've been through this, 
But I had a time in my life where I was in the waves and there were people with poles trying to push me down. I actually had a dream that there were people who hated me so much that, that what they were trying to do was push me down. That dream was very eye-opening. It was before I realized that they were doing that. So maybe like you, you've been attacked by people who are the, pushing you down in the water. Maybe you watch way too much TV this week and you kept turning on the news and you thought you were going to argue with people on Facebook and you just got turned over and over and over to you forgot where you were at. Now, I'm not saying you can't watch the news and I'm not saying you can't be on Facebook and I'm not saying you can't talk to people. But I'm saying you got to get back to where home is. The main thing, the most important things. Because here's the deal. You cannot love people if you don't feel God's love and spend time in God's love. See, there's two commands, and there's, and there's really three. Dave Daniel, my mentor, one of my mentors, used to tell me, Eric, there's actually three there. Love the Lord your God with everything. We'll just go with that, okay? Heart, soul, mind. And then it says, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, now Jesus makes an assumption here. That you love you. Some of you don't love you. Because somebody told you you were unlovable, you still believe them. But if you really fall in love with God and you read God's word and you hear how much he loves you. And you begin to let God's word let you realize how much you are loved. Guess what? You'll start to naturally love you too. Not because you deserve it. By the way, you can love somebody and not like them. I mean, I have looked in the mirror before and said, Eric, I can't believe you did that. I love you, but I don't like you. It's the same thing you say to your children if they're old enough, right? Once they hit teenage years, you're going to have that speech at least once. I love you. I just don't like you right now. Anybody ever heard that at their house? Okay. If you haven't said it to yourself yet, it's not bad. <laughs> Eric, I love you. I just don't like how you drive. You got to settle down, boy. Love the Lord your God. And then it says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. What does that mean? It means, listen, if you want to do everything you need to do in the world, you've got to come home. You've got to keep the main thing the main thing. So let me ask you this first question. By the way, here's some things that keep us from loving God. Self-love. It's not just that we haven't learned how to love ourselves. Some of us are all worried about us. You know, in America, you know what our number one goal is? Entertainment. Pleasure. We've become like the Romans. We just want to be entertained. Why? Because when you're entertained, you can get away from pain. So entertain me. Give me something to watch. Give me something to do. Even give me something to mad, mad, get mad about that has nothing to do with me so that I can be mad about something out here and not really focus on. We become self-centered. We begin to love the world. We're out in the waves getting bumped around. We're like, I really like this. And we forget about the rest that is found in heaven. And we go to the shore. And we sit in our chair. Pride. Thinking we're better than other people. The janitor and the CEO should be treated exactly the same by you. In Carl's case, that means badly. But in other people's case, I'm just kidding. He's, he's a wonderful person. But, but treat them the same. No matter how people look to you, no matter where they're from, treat them with love and kindness. It doesn't mean you know they're the same. You don't look at them and say, you're exactly like me. They're not. I hope you're not like me. I hope you go home and you thank God. God, thank you that I'm not like my pastor. So let me ask you these questions. How are you currently loving God and people? See, if you're pursuing sin in your life, it's very difficult to love God. And if you're pursuing sin in your life, something that God says is wrong, it makes it very difficult to love people. Because when you're pursuing sin, you're pursuing selfishness. And selfishness is the opposite of loving people. So let's go to the next point. Number two, ditch the urgent for the vital. So, so I'm trying to make these all D's. So we have discover the main thing, ditch the urgent for the vital. When I first came to Titusville, I heard an engineer say, you know, some days I feel like I'm moving deck chairs on the Titanic. It took me a minute. <laughs> I was like, what? He's like, I'm doing all this work on something that's not working. 
And too often we're like that. We're, I love my drill. So much better than... I'm so lazy now that when I change a lock on a door, I use my drill. Now that's lazy because it only takes like two minutes. But let me tell you something about a drill. When you use a regular Phillips bit in a drill, and this is a good one. But after you use it for a while, this bit starts to get rounded off. And you know what happens when you try to screw in screws with a rounded off bit? It does not go well. It ruins the screws that you're screwing in. It ruins all of them. So you know what you got to do? Change out the bit. Listen. If you try to live the Christian life and love people in your own power, and your own strength, you're just, you're just messing up the bit and you're going to get exhausted. You're going to be so tired because you're doing it for the wrong reason. Listen to what Jesus did here in Mark chapter 1, 32 to 38. That evening after sunset, after sunset, people brought to Jesus, listen to this, all the sick and demon possessed. Now I want you to time out for just a minute. Imagine, imagine, listen, we don't want to be near people that start to cough. We don't even want to be near people that start to cough, right? We're like, they're bringing people to Jesus, hacking up a lung. <laughs> Lepers. People with all kind of problems. They're, they're bringing them. And listen, it goes beyond there. The whole town gathered at the door. You ever had somebody knock on your door and you pretend you're not home? How many of you have ever done that? Come on. I see those hands. I see those hands, right? How many of you get aggravated when Amazon knocks? You're like, what are you knocking for? Leave the dogs alone, right? Everyone comes to the house. The whole town. Now, I don't know if you live in New Smyrna area, <clears throat> Michael, or if you live in Coco, Titusville, Merritt Island, Orlando. Imagine your whole town coming to your house. That's what happens here. And then it continues. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. So you think it was weird enough. Now you got people going, how you do it? Right? <laughs> drove out many. I just always imagine demons doing that. I'm just saying. It's all the movies. But he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. And then it says this. Listen to what happens next. Now, time out. It's a whole, the scene changes. Now, imagine this. People are probably still sleeping outside, waiting for Jesus to wake up. So what does he do? Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house. And where did he go? Solitary place where he prayed. By the way, this is all the secret to prayer right there. Just a sentence. Got up. By the way, some of us try to pray in bed. Do you ever do that one? Next thing you know, you're going to the church of the inner spring with Pastor Pillow and Reverend Sheets. Right? I ask people, did you go to church today? Yeah, Pastor Pillow, Reverend Sheets. Church of the Inner Spring. I was trying to think of the soft mattress. What's that called? The one without springs? Tempurpedic. Church of the Tempurpedic. Just doesn't sound as spiritual. Simon and his companions. Now, this is Peter, Peter the AD disciple. Now, the reason I call him the ADD disciple is he's the one that says whatever's on his mind. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. This is life. Whenever you try to get still, whenever you try to get quiet, whenever you try to go back to sit down and spend some time with God, can I tell you that all of life is going to yell at you? You've got to be busy. You've got to do more. You know, you're not a good person unless you do one more thing. Everyone is looking for you, Peter says. And then it continues. Jesus replied. Listen to this. This almost seems mean. Let's go somewhere else. To the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That's why I've come. Now, I'm sure the disciples, because they had thought the whole time he was setting up his kingdom on earth, they were thinking, hey, you're getting popular. This is the place to be. But Jesus got away and he prayed and he knew God's word. And as he spent time in prayer, he realized I'm not supposed to stay here. I've got to do what's next. Even though everybody was pushing on him to do more. By the way, sometimes we don't need an everybody from outside. Sometimes our everybody is inside. 
We don't take time to pray because we're constantly yelling at ourselves. The world wants to tell you what matters all the time. They want to tell you that this matters, that matters, and it's going to be one thing this week, one thing next week, and one thing the week after that. Have you figured this out yet? Are you paying attention? Week after week, month after month, year after year, they're going to try to tell you what's important. But just like Jesus said to Mary, to Martha, only one thing is needed. There's a lot of good things going on, but only one thing's needed. If you miss this, you won't be able to handle this. So it's okay to take on a cause. So it's okay to deal with something on Facebook. So it's okay to watch the news. But listen, listen. You need to do it with an attitude of prayer and the power of God. So how do you pray? Matthew 6. When you pray, go to your room, close the door, and pray to your father who's unseen. And then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Now this is awesome. If you pray, you're rewarded. That's in the Bible. Jesus said it. And then it continues, when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans. Basically, don't keep saying the same thing over and over, thinking that it matters to God. Don't just say meaningless words over and over again. Don't just say meaningless words over and over again. Don't just say meaningless words over and over again. You get it? You get the point? Okay. For they think they'll be heard because of their many words. They're like that little kid. Mom, 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 mom. In the movie Get Smart, that's one of my favorite scenes. He's being dragged by a rope next to a car, by a helicopter or a plane, but next to a car. And the kid's going, mom, 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 mom. And the mom turns around and goes, son, 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 son. See how annoying that is? And turns back around. Doesn't see the guy flying next to the window. And sometimes we think, if I just say it enough to God, he loves you. He knows what you need before you ask. So ask, but don't feel like you're trying to earn his love. Do you take away time away with God to refocus? Do you take time away? Now, let me show you this from Peter Lord. I like this. You can look at this a little more later. Seek God, know God, love God, obey God. Let me tell you what part of the problem is. We tend to start with obey. And think, if I'll just do a bunch of good stuff, then God will love me. That's religion. This is relationship. God, I'm going to seek you with all my heart. I'm going to sit on the beach. <laughs> I'm going to seek you. And then what's going to happen? I'm going to get to know you. I'm going to read your word. I'm going to learn about you. I'm going to learn about your character. I'm going to learn what you want, what you don't want. I'm going to learn how to love you. And as I love you, it's natural for me to do things for you. Nobody has to say to me, you better make coffee for your wife in the morning. I love to make coffee for my wife in the morning. You know why? Because I love my wife. So it's just natural. It's just natural. Now, some of you women are going to go home and yell at your husband. Please don't do that because of what I just said. You know, the pastor makes coffee for his wife. If you loved me, I get up before her. Okay, so that's one of the things. By the way, one of the guys that goes to our church, Paul, told me about this. He said he brings coffee to his wife every morning. I said, oh, that's great. And he said, and then I tell her, you're the luckiest woman alive. And then I hand her a coffee every day. Every day. Every day he does that. So we discover the main thing. We ditch the urgent for the vital. I want to hurry through this last point because I want to show you how to do this. Develop daily habits to focus your life. Your life is built on habits. Hopefully you brushed your teeth today without thinking about it. If you're over 13, you put on deodorant without thinking about it. If you're under 13, you probably haven't had a girlfriend yet. As soon as you get a girlfriend, you'll start putting on deodorant automatically. And too much cologne. Does that hit a little close to home over there, guys? Sorry. In Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, it says, For the word of God is active, excuse me, alive and active. This is where we get the word for energy. Sharper than any double-edged sword. I don't know if you have ever grabbed a razor blade by accident in your toolbox. You know, can I suggest to you not to leave open razor blades in your toolbox? Can I tell you how I know to tell you not to leave open razor blades in your toolbox? It penetrates dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That means while you're sitting in church, I read something from the Bible, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, that one was for you. And you send me a note later that says, Pastor, did you have a camera in my house? I actually have had two or three times over the years a man call me, different men, not the same man, call me and say, my wife told you what happened this week, didn't she? I'm like, number one, no. Number two, if she did, do you think I'm smart enough to remember to say it during the sermon? Number three, I wouldn't tell you anyway. No, I didn't say that. I didn't. Why? Because when you read God's word, it brings things up. Last night as somebody was leaving, they said, it's amazing. That's exactly what God had put on my heart this week. That's how it works. 
Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything's uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So don't read the Bible like a normal book. You're reading it with the author. So don't read it like the sieve that you strain spaghetti in and just let it go through. Listen, let it marinate. Meditate on his word. Let it sink in. When you read a verse, take that verse and roll it over. Read it a word at a time. Focus on a word at a time. Let God use that scripture. In Matthew 6, 9 through 13, it says this. This then is how you should pray. So we're going to read the Bible. We're going to pray. Now you all know this prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. Sorry, I do King James Version still. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. I always forget this part. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Because some people say that we've forgiven those who have sinned against us. That's just way too long. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So let me ask you this question. Do you have a daily Bible study time and prayer? So I want to give you the practical. Every day when I get up, I take my phone. Now, this is a dangerous way to read your Bible. Do you know why? Because Facebook and Twitter... And Instagram are also on here. And they send me notifications while I'm trying to read my Bible. And I'm ADD. And it is very hard for me to get a notification that says, Hey, did you know so-and-so? Their birthday's today. Woohoo! Lord Jesus, I just think, birthday, right? Squirrel. But on here I have several Bible apps. And so the one Bible app I use, it has a verse of the day. So typically I'll read the verse of the day. Now, different times during my life, I do different things. I also have the daily bread on my phone, which we also have in the back. And sometimes I'll take time to read the daily bread. Right now, I'm doing a daily devotion called My Utmost for His Highest. I don't do it all the time, but I love that devotion. It's 100 years old. And every once in a while I read it, I'm like, how did he know? Today, he talked about the distractions of life. I'm like, 100 years ago? What distractions did you have? People don't change. And then I take time to pray. I have three main ways that I pray. You've probably heard me talk about the Acts prayer time. A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, praying for other people. You may have heard me talk about the tabernacle prayer. I don't think I've talked about that a lot. But I love that one because it uses your mind to walk through the temple as you pray. But this one is the one I've been doing. It's the Lord's Prayer. And this is how you do it. Because you all know the Lord's Prayer, so you can do this anyway. You start with, our Father in heaven, and just take some time to reflect on God's greatness. So, for example, if you're outside, maybe you look at the clouds and you say, God, what you've created is so awesome. And then, hallowed be your name. And that's thanking God for how good he is. Hallowed means to be set apart. God, you're, you're so wonderful. God, you love me so much. God, you're so set apart. God, I'll never be as holy as you. Would you help me to be holy like you are? And then your kingdom come, your will be done. That's when I say, God, would you give me your desires? Because I'll be honest, sometimes when I get to this prayer, I'm like, your will be done if it looks like what I want. And many times, if we're honest, we really are praying, my will be done. By the way, Jesus prayed this, and it wasn't much later in the garden. He said to God, not my will, but your will be done. And we're very thankful for that. But the same needs to be true in my life. Your will be done. And then it says, give us today. Look, Notice here it switches to our daily bread. It doesn't say my daily bread. It says our. What is this? So you're supposed to here pray for yourself and pray for other people. So pray for what you need, but don't stop there. Now pray for what other people need. Give us today our daily bread. So Lord, provide what I need today. God, I'm dealing with this situation. I'm dealing with this trial. I'm dealing with this struggle. And then you begin to think. And maybe you have a list, and that's okay too. And you say, Father, help so-and-so who just went to the hospital. Help my cousin who's dealing with this issue. Help my friend who just had someone die in their family. And you pray for their daily bread too. And then forgive us. This is sometimes the hardest one. Sometimes when I get to forgiveness, I say, God, would you help me want to forgive? Because I'm not even happy with that person right now. I like to... Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. God, would you forgive me, but help me to forgive other people? And then finally, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's the idea. God, would you help me to overcome? You know, most of us have an area in our life that catches us. It's that area that we struggle in. Most of us have a sin that trips us. We're able to look at other people's sin and go, man, I'm glad I don't do that. Man, I know that guy who's dealing with drugs, man. He is so messed up. I just like to gossip. Right? 
We, we typically have something that trips us. So what do we do? We pray, God, would you help me to overcome that? Would you make me aware when I do that thing? Lord, when I struggle with wanting to cut people off and be passive aggressive in traffic and hit my brakes when they tailgate me. Does that sound like a prayer I've prayed before? Yes, it does. Lord, help me to love people in the other cars. I know they're just not paying attention. They're not really out to get me. Help me to remember that. What temptation do you need to pray about? And that's where you end. Life will pull you to what seems most urgent, but only one thing is necessary. Spend time in worship, in prayer, in Bible study, and then loving other people becomes natural. Loving other people becomes normal. Why? Because you've been filled with God's love. You've sat on the beach. So now you're not just swept up in the waves. You're not just swept up in the anger and the frustration and the irritation and the fear. By the way, the world always wants you to be afraid or angry. Go and sit on the beach. Take some time to pray. Allow his peace, which passes, excuse me, allow his peace, which passes all understanding. And the Bible says that'll guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd be glad to talk to you about what it means to surrender your life to him. We have a prayer at the end of the notes that you might want to take with you this week that's a reminder to refocus. So if you're here and you're not a Christian, I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. If you're in the parking lot, I'll be coming outside in a few minutes. If you're watching online, you can send me a note. But if you're here this morning or watching online or listening in the parking lot, many of us who've been Christians for a long time, if we're honest, we forget the main thing. We get distracted. So my prayer for you and for me is, Lord, would you help me to develop the habit of prayer? Lord, would you help me to remember and develop the habit of spending time in your word every day so that as I get in the world, I'm not by myself. I've taken you with me and that peace that's with me always walks me through all of life. And I can have the fruits of the spirit, love and joy and peace Patience as I drive, kindness to other people, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. God will give you all of those things. Through his spirit, as you spend time with him, he fills your life with those and it becomes natural to walk in them. That's my prayer for you, for you, and for me. Let's close in prayer and then we have a great song to close our service. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for great songs of worship that draw us to you, that remind us of what matters. But Father, it's so easy during the week to pull away from the main thing and get caught up in the waves of life and sometimes feel disoriented. Lord, I pray when we do that, we would go remember the beach umbrella. We'd remember the beach chair. And Father, we'd go back to spending time in the main thing, loving you, loving others, walking as we walk and spend time in your word that you'd remind us of what really matters. And Father, even this morning as we're here, there's some that are distracted by their trials, by their struggles. I pray even now they would know your peace in the middle of their trial. And Father, for that one today who doesn't know you, I pray today would be the day they surrender to you. They find their way home to you. In Jesus' name.